Okay. I, I'm supposed to introduce the chair, but I think he needs no introduction. <laughs> the, the, the best looking organizer, aside from me, we have Matt Lord and Chair in this session. Thank you. This is a governance session. <laughs> Thanks very much, Prince. So, um, as Prince said, this is the um, government's uh, session. Um, there has actually been a bit of a change uh, to the program. Um, unfortunately, the first speaker, Cameron, um, had to pull out a, at the last minute. Um, so what we've done is we have moved um, Tess newton Kane, um, who was scheduled to present in parallel session 4C, um, into our session. So she's going to be presenting a paper called Where Did Our Renaissance Go? Uh, challenging, challenges Facing the Melanesian Spearhead Group. Um, so she'll speak um, third. Uh, first, we will have uh, Wawan Jusuanto, and um, and after him, um, Josh Utoikamano. Um, so I might just uh, introduce the speakers uh, now. So uh, Wawan is a senior economist and special advisor to the dean of the Asian Development Bank Institute. Uh, he's been uh, at AD, ADBI since the beginning of this year. Um, prior to that, he um, worked in the Ministry of Finance in Indonesia, um, where he worked across a, a number of positions, um, mostly in the uh, Fiscal Policy Agency. Uh, he earned both his uh, Master's and PhD in International Development from Nagoya University in Japan. Um, so he will speak first. Um, second uh, uh, will be Josh. Um, so many of you know, know Josh because he has been uh, based at USP for a number of years um, and he lives here um, in Suva. Um, so he's the former director of the Pacific Islands Centre for Public Administration um, at USP. Um, he's uh, been a consultant for the ADB for, for many years. Uh, between 2001 and 2008, he was the Minister for Finance uh, of Tonga. Um, and uh, before that, uh, from 1991 to 2001, he spent 10 years as Governor of the National Reserve Bank of Tonga. Uh, the third speaker, um, Tess Newton Kane. Um, Tess uh, is a can't find your bio, but I think I can do it off by heart anyway. Um, Tess, uh, Tess is, um, lives in Vanuatu, um, she's a citizen of Vanuatu. Uh, she's um, associated with the Development Policy Centre where she is a fellow. Um, she also um, is an adjunct at, uh, Cook, um, at James Cook University uh, in Cairns. Um, and um, she's done a lot of work uh, on regionalism, um, some of it with me. Um, but uh, this particular presentation will be focused um, on the MSG. So without uh, further delay, then why would you like to begin? Okay, uh, thank you, Matt, for the introduction. So, very good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, uh, in this opportunity, I would like to present about the efficiency and the fairness in the government expenditure and. I'll take a case study in the Papua New Guinea education sector. Uh, before I uh, start my presentation, I would like to mention that this, this is my uh, uh, personal reasons. It's not, uh, my announcement is not uh, represent the, the organization. And the second one, the, to be honest, I'm not a little expert on the Papua New Guinea. This is the first time for me to study on the, the Pacific region, um, but I have done some study on this uh, same uh, topic in mostly in ASEAN country, and I I think this uh, method or this this approach can be used to the government in in Pacific region. And in this case, I try to find uh, the, the the case study in in Papua New Guinea. So this is the outline of my presentation. I hope I can finish in 15 minutes. So first, I would like to explain a little bit about the background. This the, the how the this government expenditure and long-term poverty reduction strategy. So in my presentation, I would like to uh, present about how this uh, uh, fiscal policy can be used to uh, reduce the poverty uh, reduction in in the long term. And the problem and solution and explanation explanation of the approach is called it benefit incident analysis approach, 
and then uh, I tried to use the data from Papua New Guinea and then conclusion. So this is uh, very short background. I believe if, when you uh, expert on this long long term or, or poverty reduction is, is, is common, but let me review a little bit. So basically, a uh, person uh, living in uh, poverty condition in most cases because they are born in poor household, unfortunately. And the poor household in most cases, uh, they cannot uh, provide a good, uh, they cannot provide a sufficient nutrition to their children. So the children have a low nutrition uh, condition. And by low nutrition condition, they have a low health condition. And also the poor uh, household cannot uh, provide uh, you know, a good education out, cannot send their children to, to, to education uh, system. So in most cases, they have a low education system, uh, low education level. And even they can send the children to the uh, education, uh, to the school, but because they have a low uh, nutrition, low health condition, in most cases, these children from poor household uh, cannot achieve, uh, you know, a good uh, achievement in the, in the school. And by this combination, we will produce low productivity human resources. And low productivity will have a low income. And when they are grow, grow up, they will set up a, a new household and become a new poor household. So in many uh, economies, in poverty reduction economies, they, they, they said that it's called a poverty trap. So what uh, we can do, one thing, and I think this is the most important, that the government intervention. And government intervention in most uh, developing country uh, should provide a free or maybe cheap universal education and health services. So that's the, the, the background. So this is just uh, the the literature review that what I have mentioned before, and but let's let me explain about the problem and problem and uh, yeah proposed solution for this problem. So what should government do for the targeted spending? Because uh, in this case, government has to uh, target the spending to a certain portion of population, which is poor uh, household. And the most important thing is that identify who receives this benefit from the spending. That's the, the most important. What's the, the main challenge? In most cases in developing country is data availability. And I will uh, talk also about the PNG. And my experience in ASEAN country, we have a struggle in data availability, but I found that in Pacific region, even more harder. This morning I have a discussion with Matt and Christopher that in PNG the data is still very poor. And, but I try to, uh, to find this, this uh, solution. And what is the solution? There are many alternatives, but I propose to have uh, this, this call it benefit incident analysis. This analysis actually is, a new, is not a new uh, method, but it's uh, developed by the World Bank a few years ago and has been used by many uh, experts or many countries in the world. So this is just a very simple explanation. Actually, this uh, is not a, a, a sophisticated uh, method. In, in principle, this, this approach is uh, tried to utilize the household survey of the country. Using this household survey, we try to estimate uh, the number of uh, uh, person. In, in this case, I will use the education uh, sector. So the number of students in each group of uh, each group of income, or we can group it the 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 the, uh, the, the population in, into many uh, indicator. But in my case, I will use a income indicator. So uh, if we uh, try to find the data, for example, to the Ministry of Education, yes, we have a data of the number of students in each level of education. But unfortunately, in most cases, we cannot find the background of this student, more especially the condition of the household of the student. So we use this approach using the household survey to find the background of this uh, student in its level of education. So this, uh, this approach is, is using, uh, basically uh, using that, that uh, kind of uh, approach. So, I propose a very simple thing actually that can, can be used for uh, everyone because it's, it's just use a, a, a 
a simple uh, program, spreadsheet program. And but this is the step that we can do. We obtain the unit cost of the uh, education providing by government, and then we try to categorize the people using the welfare measure. In my case, and you can use the the other other grouping, for example, gender or region and etc. And then obtain the the enrolled student in this level of education. You see, this is using a household survey and try to derive the the benefit that each group can be. Uh, it's group, uh, in its group. So uh, I, I'm trying to find the data of this uh, country, Papua New Guinea. Maybe some of you coming from not Papua New Guinea can have advice for me. And this is still preliminary study. I hope I can uh, work on it uh, further more. So this is the. Uh, I'm trying to to say that the, is that is the poverty. A problem in this region, and looking at this uh, table, I said yes, because most of the country have in 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 Pacific region have a poverty reduction. I mean, poverty incident, uh, poverty uh, people uh, population below the poverty lines around like twenty five percent, twenty percent above, and uh, based on the compared to other region is is quite high, and especially in Papua New Guinea in two thousand fourteen. I got this data from the uh, ADB uh, basic statistic as 28% of the people living below the poverty line and it used the national poverty line. So from population about 7.6 million, 2.1 million is still uh, living below the poverty line. And I also try to understand what's the Papua, uh, Papua New Guinea education system and they have uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on, on uh, uh, basic education. So they have a primary, middle, and secondary. So the primary education is elementary education, and grade one to grade six, and age seven to twelve. And middle is like seven to grade ten, for age thirteen to fifteen. And then secondary is two years national high school, is for age eighteen to nineteen, and then tertiary or university education. And once again, I just found that it's very difficult to find the data from, for this uh, Papua New Guinea uh, country and try to estimate using some uh, data from the World Bank and also from the PNG Household Income Expenditure Survey 2009-2010. But what I want to uh, show you here is that uh, this is, is uh, some education expert call it the gross enrollment rate. So basically, if you see here, the gross enrollment rate in primary education is about uh, like 80%. But once you go to the middle, then the gross enrollment rate is less than 20%. It means many people just stop until the primary education. That's a simple thing of this table. So many people in, uh, in PNG just uh, finish. I mean, most of them are finished. Even if you go to secondary, the, the rate is very low, less than 5%, I think. And using the method, we try to grouping the. This is using the uh, household survey. I try to group the 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 population into five groups. So the 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 group one is the poorest uh, group by income, and the the group number five is the the highest. I mean, the richest of of the population. And if you look at the okay group uh, table three and table four, so table four is just the, the the share. So from this table four, we easily can see that. So maybe if you said the number is a bit difficult, but we can draw this. So basically, this is we call it the concentration curve. So if the curve is below this forty-five degrees, the the the, the black one, it means that it's favor to. Uh, relatively higher level of income. So we can see here the blue one and the, the, the red one is the primary and middle is favor to uh, lower relatively lower income uh, lower income population and then the, the secondary is in favor to higher level of income. So it's very very simple and then based on this uh, situation and unfortunately so far I cannot uh, uh, 
not yet yeah receive the i mean get the the data of how the ex, uh, government expenditures on its level of education in papua new guinea uh, but, but then using this distribution of education once we know the distribution then government can use this uh, map to uh, to use to distribute the 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 expenditure of their uh, expenditure on education so primarily conclusions that the distribution of education expenditures on primary and middle education will be relatively in favor of lower income population while distribution of education expenditure on secondary education will be relatively in favor of higher income population so what what can be a recommended a recommendation on for this finding the primary findings that for long term medium term poverty reduction goals given the size of education spending we have a limited budget of course the government of PNG should place priority on primary and middle education because both uh, level are relatively in favor of lower income population and moreover actually that as I uh, previously uh, showed to you that many people just stop in the primary so the bottleneck for this uh, country is in the middle education uh, level so thank you I'm going to uh, make a short presentation on public sector management in the Pacific Islands. Um, I make the point here that um, asset management affects economic growth and poverty alleviation, um, a key target for all the countries. Um, in the presentations made yesterday, there were a lot of uh, discussions about investment in infrastructure. And what I have here is uh, taken from a recent report by the Pacific Regional Investment Facility, where they estimated that around $2 billion uh, will be spent in infrastructure over a period since 2009. I'm going to deliver the message that while we talk about investment in infrastructure, we should at least be cautious about what the actual outcomes are going to be because uh, I'm going to suggest that the linkage is not always straightforward. Um, I'd like to just touch base on some of the characteristics of the Pacific Island countries. Uh, I suppose that for all of you, this is nothing new. We're small, we're remote, um, and we have very limited land area. If you take a Papua New Guinea uh, from the equation, the land area is very small indeed. Again, uh, 10 million people, if you take out Papua New Guinea, we're left with about 2 million. And you have different growths of, uh, rates of growth in different countries. You have depopulation in some like uh, maybe Cook Islands and uh, Niue, whereas population growth in uh, Solomon Islands, uh, population is expected to exceed that of Fiji by 2030. We have dispersion of population and territories. Um, according to research by the World Bank, 72% 70, of population live in settlements of less than 10,000 people. Now this has implications for service delivery, and particularly for infrastructure. Uh, and they live on 69 dispersed um, islands. There is, of course, the usual ethnic diversity. Uh, you have your traditional governance systems, which apply at different levels, the na uh, national level, regional level, 
island level, village level, family level. And everything's kind of fluid. So trying to understand them uh, can be a challenge. Uh, we all know about vulnerability to natural disasters. Uh, research suggests that over the past 60 years, there's been something like uh, 2,400 cyclones in the region. Um, the annual losses related to natural disasters is like 2.3% of GDP, which is a fairly big number. Um, just to round things off, when you look at, talk about the losses, uh, you look at the size of the public sector. On average, the public sector consumes 55% of GDP in the Pacific. Uh, public sector wages consume 17%. Now, these are important numbers when we discuss uh, financing of maintenance. Um, of course, it's well known that uh, aid in the Pacific is amongst the highest in the world. Uh, according to OECD numbers, um, in 2013, per capita uh, aid to the Pacific was around 223 US compared with $26 for all developing countries. Economic growth that has been touched on in all the various um, presentations uh, during the different sessions, but it's fair to say that we're lagging behind other regions. So these are the characteristics, and they form the framework in which we talk about asset management. This table is based on surveys done by the World Bank and the ADB over time. Um, the main <coughs> message that comes out of this table is that maintenance is a continuing problem. Um, the PRIF report in 2013, which talked about challenging the build, neglect, rebuild paradigm, is spot on. Countries will invest in new infrastructure and then simply ignore it. They will not provide any funding for it um, and they would rather build new infrastructure rather, rather than maintain or repair all existing ones. And I'd like to discuss that a little bit of that. The other message that comes across is that where the private sector is involved in service delivery, particularly tele telecommunications, um, the service, the level of service is much better compared to those that's being managed by government departments or even some SOEs. Roads are not in good shape, although there are notable exceptions to that. Fiji, for example, is making a massive effort to uh, catch up, not only with maintenance that should have been done in the past, but going forward. Uh, I think Tonga is doing the same, and Samoa as well. But the, the general story is a lot of the resources are focused on urban areas and rural areas, um, not a high level of priority. So if you're talking about inclusive growth, there's your challenge. Um, some of the issues that come across, and, and here I'm depending on the report done by PRIF uh, about the low levels of access in rural areas to infrastructure, the low priorities, there's inefficient uh, subsidy arrangements, uh, governments um, sometimes make non-transparent decisions on offering monopolies to selected service providers, uh, despite having a perfectly um, effective procurement system in place, the lack of legal support for alternative modes. Um, you have low labor productivity and infrastructure in, inappropriate pricing policies. I now would like to talk about governance and public sector asset management. Why is it the way it is? I start by looking at how asset ma modern asset management practices has evolved. And to some extent, we find that the UK, Australia, New Zealand were at the forefront of the reforms of bringing in uh, new public management practices, moving away from the old traditional public administration 
and bringing in strategic planning, prioritization, and value for money thinking. Um, introducing accrual accounting. So these policies were then transformed and imported into the developing countries, the Pacific countries, during the 1990s and the 2000s. Unfortunately, the results were not great. We had uh, Asian Development Bank providing support, as did the other bilateral programs, in trying to move uh, the country's traditional uh, public administration systems to the new public management. They did this by the introduction of formal con contracts, performance agreements, and setting delivery targets. Uh, basically, that's a work in progress. Uh, very quickly, like I mentioned earlier, one of the key issues, one of the key lessons is that where modern methods of asset management is associated with the private sector, it is applied, the results are better than where government departments are responsible. So why is that? Um, I argue that it's due to poor political capacity and lack of leadership. Um, policymakers simply don't want to talk about asset management or maintenance. It's easier to negotiate aid for a new road or a new bridge or a new airport than to allocate funding um, for maintenance. Election cycles are short. They play a part in the deliberations by policymakers. Dealing with different aid partners is uh, important, particularly when dealing with, say, China. Um, when China came into the Pacific, they brought a whole different approach towards providing aid. Uh, for example, they didn't have long um, uh, reviews and analysis of the long-term implications of their investment. They did a 20-page loan agreement that didn't really say very much, except that they would build roads and bridges, and politicians love that. Of course, quality suffered, but that's another issue. Um, government budget constraints. According to the PRIF study, it said there that uh, Pacific countries should be allocating between 5 and 7% of GDP to maintenance, which they're not. Why? Because there's uh, aid donors who are willing to offer to build new um, investments. And it suits the election cycle. You have problems with uh, public financial management processes um, and things like dual budget systems. You have a recurrent budget and a development budget in a lot of the Pacific countries. And unfortunately, even, even though the staff are based in the same ministry, they don't talk to each other. Pricing policies are also an issue raised in the brief report. And capacity, planning, uh, capacity for planning of asset management maintenance and maintenance is also an issue. These are all limitations which suggest to me that dependence on investment lifting um, economic growth in the long term should be treated with caution. The main th thing that we need is political stability and capacity. We need a functioning uh, parliament. We need public accounts committees which meet and ask questions about why roads are not being maintained, why bridges are not being maintained. Simple things like that. Where that's not happening, why should the ministries worry about it. And so the options for addressing, uh, the options to improve asset management, uh, there are four suggestions here, dealing with the resource constraints, uh, building accountability and the appropriate incentives within uh, the public sector, and building up organizational capacity. 
and of course being more proactive in dealing with development uh, partners. Here is just a list of good practices. This shows how you do things rather than just going through the list of what to do. Um, and just to wrap it up, uh, the challenges are there, but given the enough will and support from development partners, you, you, there are certain steps that can be taken um, to address this and deliver uh, the desired outcomes. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to come and stand over here because otherwise you won't be able to see me because um, I'm not tall enough to stand behind and talk about inclusivity. It's about time we got lecterns made a bit more inclusive. Okay, so my um, consideration of governance moves to the regional, sub-regional level. Um, when at that level, in terms of regional governance, as we know um, further to the implementation of the framework for Pacific regionalism, there is an ongoing um, consideration of improved governance at the regional level, including how resources are allocated and managed at the regional level. And part of that consideration is what role, if any, is there for an improved interface between regional and sub-regional institutions. And so I'm looking at that from the position of the Melanesian Spearhead Group. Now, you may be wondering where this very um, very elaborate title for my presentation comes from. And it comes from the fact that last year I was coaxed out of academic retirement to write a chapter for a book called The New Pacific Diplomacy. And I was given the title of the chapter to write to, which was The Renaissance of the Melanesian Spearhead Group, which basically took as its premise that in the last, since about 2009 or maybe a bit before, the Melanesian Spearhead Group had demonstrated um, a renaissance, a growth in profile, a growth in strength. Um, so what I'm going to look at during this presentation is the evidence for that premise and what has happened since this book came out, which was not a long time ago, but the Melanesian Spearhead Group seems to be determined to render this particular piece of writing um, obsolete before it even really gets going. Um, so the evidence for this renaissance is, uh, includes things like its longevity, so it's been around for a while. Um, it, it, it has had, up until very recently, a high level of political engagement, and some of that is captured in the most recent forward plan for the MSG. It has su successfully negotiated a sub-regional trade agreement, although that, that is one of the things that's currently um, suffering a bit. It's introduced a skilled movement scheme within Melanesian countries, um, which certainly exists on paper. Um, it's the actual implementation of that scheme is something else that's also um, not as far along as we might have expected it to be. And it's also demonstrated a certain amount of diplomatic innovation, um, particularly in relation to where we're currently at, which it's managed to have uh, a West Papuan representation group and Indonesia in the same forum, which is obviously um, something that we maybe wouldn't have expected to see 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's something that it, uh, the MSG should be congratulated on. But as we're going to see, it's possibly the reason why the MSG now finds itself in a whole range of um, pickles. So the challenges 
Uh, now, as, as Matt said, I was supposed to be in the trade session, so I decided I should put some trade in here. Trade troubles have been problematic for the MSG, and they manifested themselves in several ways. Um, the picture of Fiji water, which we're all enjoying, and I love drinking Fiji water when I am here in Fiji. When I'm at home in Vanuatu, I get a bit disappointed when I am offered Fiji water because we have perfectly good water preparation operations of our own. But this, what that illustrates is that the MSG trade agreement has obviously been seen to have benefited some countries more than others, and in particular, Fiji. Um, the, to, below that, we've got the ox and palm corned beef, one of PNG's um, signature products. As we know, there is an ongoing dispute between PNG and Fiji about being able to bring in ox and palm. Fiji maintained that it's a fighter, a biohazard issue, it's a sanitary issue. PNG complained that it's a politics issue. But what, for whatever the reason is, despite the fact that the trade agreement is in place, you can't get ox and palm out of Papua New Guinea into Fiji. And then to the far right, we have a, a reminder of the famous, no doubt you will all recall, the great Carver versus Breakfast Crackers war between Fiji and Vanuatu. Um, so Vanuatu sought to prevent the import of breakfast crackers from Fiji in order to protect its domestic industry, despite the fact that it was allowed under the trade agreement. Um, Fiji responded by banning the import of Vanuatu Kava. Needless to say, that didn't last long. Um, but it, it are, it, these are all indications of how the fact that this agreement was in place and appeared to have this high level political engagement and acceptance when it actually comes to making it work in practice across wharves and you know at the borders, um, the implications sometimes overcome the, the intent. The most significant um, issue that we're talking about at the moment and is going to, you know, is going to be the big talking point is the issue of membership. And the membership issue really centers around what, how the MSG can or should accommodate the interests of West Papuan representative groups. So this is a timeline of how that has played out. Um, I'm not going to go through the history, um, I will leave that there for you to just quickly absorb uh, because it goes on and on. Uh, just to update those of you who don't yet know what happened last week in Honiara at the Special Leaders Summit, um, after a very tense lead up and after two failed attempts to get the leaders together this year, they did meet um, in Honiara last week. And what has been decided is that the decision for the ULM WP admission will be deferred until September when they will reconvene in Port Vila hosted by the Vanuatu government. In the meantime, the Secretariat has been tasked with formulating criteria for membership of the MSG. Um, that may beg the question as to why those criteria didn't exist before. Um, that's not that's, that's not the that's just the smokescreen for what really needs to happen, which is there will be yet more um, back channel diplomacy around trying to achieve some sort of consensus before the meeting in September. The the real the real politic of that is that the chances of achieving that consensus are not going to improve between now and September. So. We just have to wait and see what happens. So that, that, is, that is a really key issue, and this is the one that is now causing political people, politicians, members of the political leadership in some member countries, particularly Vanuatu, but also Solomon Islands, to start saying things like they don't consider the MSG to be relevant anymore. It's also the issue around which we're seeing an increasing division between the views of civil society as, exp as expressed by groups such as Piango and the Pacific Council of Churches, as well as national groupings, that they, they are very concerned that their leaders are not taking forward those views and acting on them in this sub-regional forum. And then challenge three in this Gordian knot is that of funding. Um, so the, there are various aspects to the funding. There's the costs of maintaining the Secretariat building in Port Vila, um, further to its construction, which was funded by China. There are staffing costs, which have become very controversial quite recently. 
There are costs of meetings. There are difficulties in getting member countries to pay their agreed share of the funding. That's complicated by the fact that the FLNKS is not in a position to contribute at all because of its status. So its costs are shared among the other members. Um, it receives minimal project funding um, and Melanesian Solutions was touted as a possible way of addressing this, which was a, a somewhat interesting um, concept of using the MSG Secretariat become a, a consulting firm to and, and use it basically doing consultancy. Uh, so last week in Honiara, what happened? Was the appointment of the new DG confirmed? Yes, it was. Um, earlier in the year, this was looking to be a very contentious issue with Vanuatu particularly concerned that the appointment of Mr. Yavola had been rushed through without going through um, proper, proper processes. That's now, that wrinkle now seems to have been ironed out and he has been confirmed as the new DG. Was the third iteration of the MSGTA signed? No, it wasn't. Um, the work of the foreign and trade ministers on getting the text in place was acknowledged and accepted by leaders and um, they were sent away to work on national issues to get all their national processes in line prior to the signing of that agreement. Was ULMWP made a full member of the MSG? No, it wasn't. It, re it retains its observer status for now, and that decision has been deferred until September, as I've already mentioned. Was Indonesia asked to leave the MSG? This is a particular position adopted by Vanuatu, which it sees as a corollary of admission of ULMWP, is that Indonesia is asked to leave. That did not happen. Indonesia retains its status as an associate member. What else happened? Um, well, Melanesian Solutions was canned, which was, a very, was probably a very good idea because nobody really understood what the business case for it was. Um, there were some references made, perhaps most significantly in terms of the funding, to some significant restructures, particularly at the Secretariat. So we don't know whether that means the Secretariat will be reduced in size or whether um, different things will be done, but certainly we're expecting to see some fairly significant restructuring done largely around the need to cut costs. Um, there were also some approvals given to things such as um, an approval for a sub-regional police minister's meeting. And this is indicative of what we've seen elsewhere in the, in the MSG is setting up of what you could call sub-regional architecture of bringing together their foreign ministers, their trade ministers, now they're looking at police ministers. They've explored things like um, a common customs union, a common currency. All of these things are in various stages of discussion, research, analysis and approval going forward. So what does this mean for the future of the MSG? I often get asked, oh, is this it? Is this going to pull the MSG apart? The MSG has weathered a number of storms already, um, including uh, issues around chairing arrangements in 2010, where there was pressure not to pass the chairing to Fiji, but they went ahead and did that. Um, there were issues between Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea during the Bougainville crisis about border border issues. So there have, been a, there have been a number of storms already that the MSG has weathered. So, you know, we would hope that they can weather this one as well. It, it is particularly significant. Um, you know, it, it's very, you know, the, the conversations tend to be very um, emotive, particularly around the West Papua issue. Um, I, I tend to be a bit more prosaic about it in that I think it's going to come down to the money. Um, there are certainly some very worrying indications that key members of the group are increasingly feeling frustrated by, by the way it's moving. There's a lot of blame shifting going on, so the, the political leaders are very keen to blame the Secretariat, certainly the past leadership of the Secretariat, as, and the new DG has said that he's walked into a mess and it's all awful and you know he's got this huge amount of work to do. He comes with a very interesting background, including a previous um, position with the Pacific Islands Development Forum. 
and certainly what we may see is an increasing convergence of activity between MSG and PIDF and what that means going forward is is hard to tell. Um, I think I don't think I don't think the story's over yet. I think 2016 is going to continue to be um, a difficult year for the MSG and it may be that it looks quite different by the end of the year than it did at the start. I think certainly in terms of the regionalism, sub-regional sub-regionalism interface, this is the area that's going to require the most amount of attention, um, both in terms of maximising available opportunities and also mitigating any risks. And I think, I think that's it, it is, that's it. Thank you. Can I please get the speakers up the front here? So there are three um, excellent presentations, a rather eclectic set of presentations. Um, sometimes you'll get chairs try to force a link between the three presentations. I'm not going to do that, I think. <laughs> I think I would fail. Um, but we might try to group um, questions uh, for particular presenters. But um, I might just ask for questions uh, generally um, to begin with, and then we'll go from there. So. Does anyone have a question? Uh, up the front here, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is for Mohamed. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, your suggestion that to escape a public trap for poor passwords, uh, governments to give a priority on education. So. I think for this money will matter. So my, I'm curious about uh, what uh, percentage of budget uh, does uh, uh, Papua New Guinea PNG spend on public education? Is this a significant uh, for the country? And also the, about uh, uh, about the uh, comp compulsory education system. So for PNG, uh, is this uh, the compulsory uh, education system is not possible right now in terms of the budget burden for the country? Thank you. Okay, if you can just hold off for one, we might get a, a set of questions. So um, we've begun with a question uh, on education in PNG. So does anyone else have a question uh, on that first presentation? If you can answer that first question to begin with. Okay, so okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yu, for your uh, question. Uh, yes, as I mentioned in my presentation, this uh, so far is <clears throat> very difficult for for me to to find the data of this PNG uh, education uh, spending, and uh, really I cannot answer your question how much percentage of this uh, budget of the PNG on the education sector, and I I think this is the uh, my homework to to find the, the this this issue, and about the compulsory education as far as I understand understand that uh, so far uh, PNG government has not uh, declared the compulsory education in, in, in their country. So <clears throat> uh, that's, that's uh, so far I understand. Yeah, I, I think the <clears throat> in most uh, developing country we he introduced the compulsory education system, uh, a compulsory education, but my understanding in PNG, I don't know, maybe might know better than me that we, I found that so far no uh, compulsory education, and I think they should put this compulsory education as uh, at least like nine years education, a uh, compulsory education. 
So this is something that a number of um, colleagues of mine have done work on in the Development Policy Centre and PNG has, um, under the O'Neill government, put in place a tuition-free education policy. Um, and there is a bit of analysis around the effects of that. Um, oh, a question for you. Um, your, um, your model basically just looked at the number of students and didn't look at the quality um, of education. So I want to ask if that's something that is important and certainly from the work that, that we've done at the centre, um, that seems to be a very big um, issue in PNG. Uh, I guess the question is, um, can you measure quality or can you include quality in your analysis? Uh, yeah, so this, uh, this, this method uh, actually is, that, that, that's the weakness because we, we, the assumption, once, one of the assumptions is that uh, the, the cost per student is assumed to be same, but actually it's not, it's region. And the, the second one is not, uh, we, we cannot uh, analyze the quality for, for, for this uh, method. But this method can be used to, because this the, 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 the background is that the government have a limited budget and the government has to uh, provide this budget for targeted, uh, targeted uh, population. So this method try to help the policy maker to mapping uh, their, their population based on the education and income. Are there any other questions regarding that first presentation? Okay, I'll, I'll open the floor to other questions more broadly. Uh, I'll begin in that case. Oh, we have one here, please. Thank you, and thanks to all the presenters. This is, this is really a question for, for Tess. Tess, the, the MSG has had uh, well, it has constantly reinvented. I, well, it's, this is this is a proposition that I'd, I'd, I'd love you love you to comment on, and then a question. So the proposition is that the MSG has constantly reinvented itself. It was born out of solidarity for colonised Melanesian peoples. Fiji stayed uh, um, uh, absent, distant from the grouping for a very long time, and then joined. Um, the grouping went from being essentially a, one focused on post-colonial issues to one focused on trade issues, and I think you could argue with a, with a great deal of success at, at, at least at times, although as you, as you pointed out with some, some difficulties as well. Um, it's clearly a period of flux, as you've said now. So, that, so that's, so my, I guess my proposition is it has always been a, a, a grouping that has sort of rearranged itself. You know, do you think that's true and do you think that will continue to be the way into the future? And then taking that history into account and where we are now, what do you think the Melanesian Spearhead Group looks like and what will it be focusing on 10 years down the track? Thanks. Right, just needed to press the right thing. Um, I agree, it, you know, there's, it's very hard to sort of say the MSG has always been X because the, the, the transitions that you've mentioned are certainly valid. I think this is um, a period of flux. I think what is possibly different about this one is that we are seeing much more public criticism among the leadership. So we had a very strong statement by Vanuatu and Solomon Islands at the beginning of the year around the appointment of the DG. We've had, you know, Vanuatu making it public that they, you know, the Prime Minister has written to the Prime Minister of Solomon Islands. Subject to what happened in Honiara, the Prime Minister of Vanuatu basically said, this organisation is failing the people of this region. So that level of public uh, angst being voiced at, at that level is something I think that renders this 
transition period different from some of the others and I think it is one that, that we would generally find concerning having said that as we know within the context of Melanesian politics these things can be worked through and accommodations can be made. The Indonesian influence it's easy to overstate it, but I also think it would be naive to understate it. I think we saw in the lead up to the meeting in Honiara um, a very aggressive diplomatic media, social media campaign by the Indonesian leadership against admission of the ULMWP, um, and that manifested itself in different ways. So for as long as Indonesia remains at the table, it is going to quite rightly see itself as having a role to play in influencing the decision making, and it is going to exercise that role. It brings with it a, you know, never ending resources compared to other countries that might seek to counterbalance that. So I think, I think this period of flux is possibly one that could be more um, transformational than others and what that transformation looks like we've yet to see. I think in 10 years time um, we will see uh, an MSG that is um, one way or another much more responsive to the needs of uh, the entire Melanesian community, I think, that, uh, I think we will see national leaders demanding more of the MSG in terms of supporting their ability to respond to the, their community's demands. I think the risk of the MSG is that, um, which regional organisations suffer from as well, is that there are no votes in the MSG, so nobody gets elected in West Santo on the basis of, oh, I'm going to go to the MSG and do X. So if the MSG is going to continue to keep or, or retain the political uh, buy-in that it's had so far, it's going to need to be able to provide something to Melanesian politicians that they can take back to their constituents and demonstrate as being beneficial for them. And I think what we will see is an increasing focus on activities that support that uh, benefit young people. So what we may see is a uh, an increased focus on cultural and sporting and educational links. Thanks, Tess. Um, any other questions related to the MSG? Up the back, I think. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Tess, for that update. You made an um, intriguing comment about staff costs being an issue, and I have heard that from others, but uh, could you elaborate on... No, you didn't. You heard it from me last night. No, but I heard it from you <laughs> and from others, so I'm very keen to find out. I mean, it's unusual that staff costs would be an issue. The staff costs are an issue, well, the costs in general are an issue because it's an expensive organisation to run. There is, uh, there is information available non-publicly or not written down that um, staff salaries were increased significantly during last year on the, ba the basis for that I don't know what it is so there is a certain amount of discontent among the people that write the checks that um, the debt was was established from within the Secretariat with no real no real basis in terms of um, what this was going to deliver for the group as a whole. So the, certainly we can expect to see staffing structures and costs being very much a focus of the cost-cutting measures that we can expect over the next little while. All right, thank you. Um, were there any other questions? There's one at the back. Uh, just a question uh, to Tess. It's just paraphrasing that last comment you made, Tess, about the opportunity and the risk. And just a general comment around sub-regionalism. What opportunity do you see uh, sub-regionalism presents? What risk does it present in, the, in, in its interface with regionalism under the framework for Pacific regionalism? 
in light of the, the many sub-regional groups, the MSG, the, the Polynesian leaders and others? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think, um, the, well, first of all, the framework for Pacific regionalism envisages sub-regionalism as being part of the way forward. So I think that, that in itself presents a really important opportunity. I think there is a perception on the part of sub-regional groups, not just the MSG, but the others as well, that um, they've been largely ignored by regional crop agencies and other regional institutions. So the fact that there is now an opening for that dialogue, I think, is something that's very important. I think there are opportunities. I mean, and I, I, I've mentioned this, I think, to, to the people at the Secretariat before, if the issue of West Papua is now on the agenda of the Pacific Island Forum leaders, and that is a good thing in some ways, but it's also it's an uncomfortable place for it to be for various reasons. Now, if the MSG were in a position to take it on, it could be given that issue to deal with on behalf of the region as a whole. So that would be a huge opportunity for the sub-regional strength to take forward an issue that has become important to the region as a whole. The risk is that if the sub-regional entity is not coping or is struggling or is, is divided, it then lessens its availability to take on those roles for the region. Um, I also think that there are, when you look at the other bit of, the other type of sub-regionalism which the parties to the narrow agreement is an example of which is where countries come together around an issue, rather, not necessarily because they're geographically located close together or because they've got cultural ties, but because they've got a thing they want to work on, that again, there is an opportunity for the regional agencies to devolve governance and resources to a, a sub-regional grouping that's best placed to develop um, a practice or expertise or a, a pool of service delivery. And this draws on the work that Matt and I did recently about whether sub-regionalism is better, whether pooling of service delivery can be better achieved at the sub-regional level than at the regional level. The jury's still out on that, but I think when we did that work, I was very enthusiastic and Matt was less so, and as is the way of things, I now tend to agree more with Matt than I did with my previous position. <laughs> Thank you for that admission, Tess. <laughs> uh, any other questions um, on the MSG or on sub-regionalism? I might throw in one then. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on um, what do you think is going to happen with regards to the uh, referendum in Bougainville? How is that going to affect the MSG? And do you think that the MSG has a role to play in negotiating potential tension between PNG and Solomon Islands? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, at the, at the very basic level, if Bougainville were to secede um, further to the referendum, we would expect it to, if it wanted to join a sub-regional organisation, the MSG would be the one it would join, most likely. So that would increase the membership of the MSG in a way different to if New Caledonia becomes independent. Um, if the MSG, I think, would certainly, again, if the MSG has sufficient internal strength, I think it would be very well placed to assist with overseeing that process in a similar way to how it oversees the Namir Accords in New Caledonia. Obviously, it's got a lot, it's got a vested interest in seeing that process proceed smoothly and safely and appropriately. Again, I think the risk is that there's the internal divisions and um, disruptions make it very difficult for it to take on any extra um, external responsibility at this current time, but hopefully that will improve sooner rather than later. So um, we might move on to the third presentation. Are there any um, questions uh, for Josh? A quiet audience today. Uh, so I have one. Um, oh, there is one? Ah, here in the middle, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Josh, for your meticulous presentation. Uh, my question is that earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that despite the massive uh, investment in the infrastructure, 
in the Pacific Island countries, it did not uh, always yield the desired results. And uh, so one of the reasons is that also, you know, like for a particular project, if a, but if a budget is allocated by the time the project is completed, the budget budget allocation for that particular project, you know, rises astronomically, and you know, like it's inflated. So what could be you know, like some of the reasons as to why the, you know, like it does not, despite the massive you know, like investment pumped in in the infrastructure projects, it, you know, like it does not get the uh, does not attain obtain the desired results uh, on the ground. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. There, there are several reasons as to why they don't always deliver the desired results. First of all, the manner in which um, the, uh, those who are responsible for building the projects are selected and the lack of proper um, supervision. Uh, for example, I know that in Tonga, we, we took out a large loan to build new buildings after we had a slight internal problem, uh, which resulted in uh, part of our central business district being burned down. Um, we took out a loan. The buildings were put up by contractors over whom we had no control. And the result was that we had buildings which were already in the process of deteriorating before they were actually opened. So it being able to deal with um, procurement, dealing with donors, um, and being able to identify um, partners who can provide you with the right type of support. The other issue is that quite often within the public sector, you don't have enough qualified people who can ensure that projects are managed adequately. Um, and brought to fruition. Um, there is also a tendency at policy makers level, that is within ministers, that they are less interested in maintaining projects after they are completed. They are only interested in new ones. It's the old um, tendency to prefer to have large openings where they have lots of photo opportunities. Um, there's no such photo opportunity if someone has maintained a bridge. Uh, but putting up a new bridge is a big plus for them. Um, so that's, that's the sort of issue that we have. Um, there's a saying that sometimes uh, donors would give you a large asset, but when you talk about long-term maintenance, what you're actually being handed is a huge liability. Um, so I, I hope that addresses your question. Any other questions um, for Josh? Thank you, Josh, for the presentation. You talked about putting in place um, incentive structures um, to, to ensure that there was good maintenance on public assets. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you meant by that and what that might look like? Thank you. Part of the challenge that um, has been discovered in terms of the um, implementation of infrastructure projects is that sometimes stakeholders are not involved. Um, those who have an interest that uh, roads which are built through their village are maintained. And when that happens, there's a sort of a disconnect. Uh, what we need is to involve stakeholders so that they would be able to um, draw the attention of the authorities to repairs that need to be done. Otherwise, when uh, assets deteriorate, they simply shrug their shoulders and say, well, that's not our problem. We'll wait for the next donor to turn up and build another one. Um, so it's changing the culture, changing the mindset so that there is inclusiveness. Um, that's, that's one of the suggestions that I have. Thanks. All right, thank you, Josh. Uh, this one up front here. Thank you, Josh, for the uh, a very good presentation. And <clears throat> asset management is uh, a very big problem where I come from in Kiribati as well. And, uh, 
Uh, one of the, the ideas that is being uh, uh, floated around to solve the long-term management issues uh, or the maintenance issues is to incorporate the maintenance as part of the procurement process so that the, uh, the supplier of the equipment or the asset is also uh, responsible for the maintenance. Is that uh, a workable uh, solution? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I think that that is one of the uh, solutions that has been suggested. Um, so that when uh, new programs or new projects are designed, um, you already build in the need for future maintenance. Or better still, design structures that would require minimum maintenance over time. Um, so that it becomes an integrated part of the whole planning process. The challenge for some of the countries is that they do not have the skilled manpower to work on this, to insist that these should be part of the whole planning process. Um, otherwise, the, the practice is that if donors are uh, responsible for funding a particular project, they come with their own uh, way of doing things. And sometimes they don't listen to what countries uh, recommend. Um, and, and that can be an issue that has to be addressed. And, and if I'd had more time, I would have expanded on that. So I think you have raised a very pertinent point there. Thank you. I might jump in then with my question because it also relates to donors. So um, I guess in your talk, you. Uh, you spoke about some of the political obstacles to maintenance, the, the rewards from large infrastructure projects as opposed to ongoing maintenance. Um, there's, if you read the literature internationally, the other argument is that uh, poor maintenance is the result of donor activities because donors themselves favour very large infrastructure projects um, over, um, uh, which I guess pro uh, provides incentives um, for the recipient country to, to simply try to get as many projects as possible and not maintain them because they'll be replaced anyway. Um, I wanted to ask you for your thoughts on, um, on the activities of donors uh, and uh, ways in which donors could improve um, their practice uh, in order to encourage maintenance in the region. Um, thanks for that, Matt. Um, I think donor practices um, are a key factor in the way that projects are designed. We talk about election cycles for countries, but you also have election cycles in the um, donor countries. And not only do you have election cycles, but you have organizational structure within um, the bureaucracy, which is responsible for administration of aid. So all these factors, uh, sometimes they are aligned and you're very fortunate you end up with a good project. If they're not aligned, you have sudden reductions at the policy, at the political level, in the ter in the amount of aid that's available. You have changes within the bureaucracy in how they do things and their priorities. They change, and the countries are left trying to ca play catch up. Um, sometimes they just give up and say, "Well, whatever you do is fine with us. We'll worry about the consequences later." Politicians can say that because in some countries they're in office for only three years. And they come the next election and they're out. So, um, but for stakeholders, they have a long-term interest in projects that, as they are designed, um, and how that works out. So, there needs to be a better understanding of how the donor community operates. There's a lot of talk, for example, uh, about harmonisation, but I think that's. Um, a work in progress. It's very difficult for organizations to give up the way they have done things uh, in order to meet uh, what another organization wants. There's a lot of discussion um, and uh, Pacific countries are sometimes left in the dark as to how that is done. Certainly when dealing with China, um, it's completely in the dark. Um, when we're negotiating with officials in China, you sometimes have no idea who you're talking to. 
Um, and and that, that's, that lack of transparency uh, needs to be dealt with. Any um, other comments or questions related to that point or to Josh's presentation more broadly? Okay, uh, I'll throw the floor open to other questions for any of the three presenters. Uh, this is your last chance, uh, otherwise I'll, I'll bring the session to a close. All right, well, please join me in thanking the three presenters. We're a little early, but we'll have lunch.